Welcome back to Do Theology, where we keep doctrine in its place. How should the paradigm of the chart impact our closest relationships in life, especially when someone changes his doctrine? We've all known people who have evolved religiously, and there have been times when our relationships with those people have been directly impacted as a result. There are times when this should be the case, but there are also times when this shouldn't be the case. Today, we'll walk through a few of these scenarios, and hopefully we'll all grow in our ability to handle disagreements in our doctrine. Neither Bethel nor Hillsong meet the biblical definition of a true church. Did you know that Jesus was born again? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. It's not just a black and white issue. There's an issue, there's a question of moderation and how damaging and how harmful things are. Not every act of divine revelation is equal in authority. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement. I mean, it's, it's hard to even respond to that, isn't it? It's, it's mind-numbing, it's blasphemous. When the apostles use the word atonement, they do not depict an angry God. It's cryptic. It's watered down. It has nothing to do with the judicial aspect of the Christian gospel. The most important of all doctrines is that the Bible is the word of God. They have different ideas than you do. You don't have to automatically kick them out of the kingdom. Well, Ken, you can see I have behind me a chart banner. Isn't that cool? That is cool. I thought it was going to be a little more epic. It's like four by four, I think, uh, but not as not as big and like hey, it's a big chart banner as I thought it would be. It's just farther back. It's the perspective it issue, right? You just gotta. Zzz. Can you imagine if that was right behind me? Since my shelves are right there, that'd be that'd be like, wow. Yeah, and here, like my big old coconuts blocking it here. So I, you know, whatever. But our friends at Key Radio in Provo, Utah, printed that off uh, for me for fun. Uh, it was not a request that I made. They just, they did it. And so thanks key radio. Cool. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of fun having that there. It's not a permanent thing. I just did it for the episode. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to access my commentaries behind it. So and we but can't have it, that. It is very apropos for today's conversation because we are talking about the chart and how this paradigm of viewing doctrine as primary, secondary, and doubtful or the realm of opinions how that impacts our closest relationships in life. And uh, before we get into that, how about we discuss, um, actually, before we discuss what we're going to discuss, and before we discuss the thing we're going to discuss before we discuss, I forgot, <laughs> we made a promo code Oh yes. our, uh, uh, for our store. Uh, it's fall, and you should get yourself a hoodie. That makes sense. And from now through the end of October, you can use the code DTHOOD, all caps, no spaces, DTHOOD, to get 10% off a hoodie in the Do Theology store. Store.dotheology.com. Get yourself a hoodie. Uh, support the show. That, that would be really cool. Thanks. Thanks for considering that, assuming you are. Okay. Now, before we discuss what we're going to discuss, let's give an overview of the chart. You want to do that, Ken? Sure. So if, if for our uh, our veteran listeners, the seasoned ones who have been with us for a while, this is our podcast is based on this. So this is something that you've heard before, but it's old uh, hat. Yeah, but but hopefully uh, we with some other listeners that have uh, not listened to our entire back catalog and such and uh, might be being exposed to these things for the first time. If you go to our website, do theology dot com slash chart. Uh, you can view the chart that this whole podcast is based off of that we have engaged so many conversations with in the relationship to the chart. But there you will see a beautiful chart with three columns. And we have primary, secondary, and the third column where we've labeled doubtful things. Uh, but each of these columns functions in a, in a very important way. Primary doctrine, truth that affects fellowship with others. These are the foundational issues to Christianity. These are, uh, this is what comprises Christianity at its clearest level. They transcend hermeneutical differences. So everyone who embraces the, the authority and the sufficiency the, and the uh, clarity of Scripture is going to land in the same place on these issues. This is the gospel message. This is issues of theology that, that may not be part of the gospel, but they're still definitional and fundamental to uh, Christianity itself, things like uh, the Trinity and uh, things of that nature. 
But then there's also issues of practice that we have put in this primary column as well, where scripture is crystal clear about certain things of our personal ethics and morality, uh, our, how we should be engaging our local churches and the necessity of baptism and Lord's table and things of that nature. And so those would all be primary things. And so we want to hold fast to the things that God holds fast to. These things are crystal clear in his word. Many of these things in his word, God has placed salvific weight to. That if you embrace or reject these things, it's, it, it impacts your relationship with the Lord. And so we recognize that these things are primary. And we want to go, we're willing to go to war for these things. We're willing to fight for them and willing to die uh, for these things. In the secondary column, we have convictions that are theological or practical in nature. But we're going to land in different places and still be considered Orthodox believers. On these things. So the, depending on the hermeneutic that you're bringing to the table, depending on on where, uh, on where how you're reading the scripture, you're going to end up in different places. So think about stuff like Calvinism versus Arminianism. Think about things like covenant theology versus dispensationalism or your view of the end times or a whole host of other issues. The practice of how your church observes things like baptism or the Lord's table, things like that, that can shape our worldview. It impacts our methodology. And we're coming to different conclusions based on a different hermeneutic that we're bringing to the table. So we encourage in with the secondary doctrine column, we're to take a stance on these things, but we're keeping fellowship with believers who disagree. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to end up in the same church necessarily. A lot of these differences do naturally create different church, local church expressions and denominations and such. But we are recognizing one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, the third column, doubtful things. These are conscience matters that can often affect our friendships with one another. These are issues that we're going to come to different convictions based on how the Holy Spirit is working within our life and how we're reading scripture at times. But we're recognizing that other people can have different convictions on these things and still be members in good standing in the same local church. So your conviction on something like uh, alcohol is always the easy example that we can pull from. One individual is going to completely abstain. Another individual is going to partake in moderation. And both of those can be happening at the exact same time in the same local church. And it should not affect uh, the um, how we view one another in terms of spirituality or things of that nature. Um, and so those things, we want to obey our God-given conscience. We want to use wisdom. This is something that we always stress when talking about the third column, that these things are not things that are unimportant or they don't matter. They do, and we need to approach them with, with our conscience, and we need to be uh, submissive to the Holy Spirit's guidance within our lives. But at the same time, we also want to recognize that how we view these things can impact other people, and we don't want to be a stumbling block to others. And the thing that we recognize is we, that, that's a broad strokes mm -hmm. overview of the whole thing. On that chart, though, the thing at the top that's going to prevent so many errors from taking place, primary doctrines should not be violated by other doctrines. These objective truths in the primary column inform and limit both our convictions in the secondary column and also our conscience issues in the third column. That means... We recognize that every of these positions in the secondary column or even the doubtful column, there's extremes of those positions and those practices that are sinful and that do violate the primary column. And this rubric, this framework is not designed to give you license and freedom to do that. Now, we want to recognize that, hey, where we stand with primary doctrine limits and informs how we think about secondary and doubtful things. Wow, that is a lot of content that you just summed up. Um, can you believe, listener, that all of that is on one sheet of paper as a visual aid? <laughs> um, and that's and there's a lot more on there too. That was just the tip of the iceberg. And as you can tell, there is a lot for us to discuss with that as a launching pad. When you have that kind of as the the foundation for conversations for a podcast like we do, there are a lot of different directions you can go. Uh, but Ken just did a great job summing all of that up. And um, there's so much for you to see. Again, that's at dotheology.com slash chart. The name of this podcast, dotheology.com slash chart. You can find it in Spanish, black and white version, Romanian version. Yeah. You want to translate to another version? Just let us know. We'd love yeah. for you to do that. But today um, we're using that chart as a launching pad to go the direction of 
our relationships, our closest relationships. And, and we'll start out by talking about how we can use the chart to find a spouse, how we can use the chart to find a church. These are two very important endeavors that people enter into. And boy, our doctrinal disagreements and the level of significance that we put on different doctrines certainly plays into how we find a spouse, how we find a church. And so um, let's start by talking about the objective, uh, not not like the goal, but the the objective meaning that which is objectively true. What is objectively right and wrong in our endeavors of partnering with people, whether that's in a marriage or in a church? Uh, the first is you got to get the gospel right. I mean, there yeah. is just there's just zero wiggle room on this uh, for a Christian to does to go off and marry a non-Christian. I mean, you, that's that's not okay. I mean, you you've got Second Corinthians chapter six talking about how foolish it is that light would be partnered with darkness and how that's even unthinkable. It's not the word foolish doesn't show up. Paul just presents it like that is just unthinkable mm-hmm. that um, one of God's people would be joined with a pagan in such a way. Um, and, and you go through that column of primary doctrine and it's like, well, okay. Uh, you know, this person is a Mormon or a Jehovah's witness or whatever, you know, yeah, that th- th- I want to marry this person and, and I don't want my emotions to get in the way. Um, you know, he or she denies the Trinity, but we're, well, we can work through that. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. And it's the same with the church, right? Um, if that's a church that denies the Trinity or denies the authority of the Bible, that denies the uh, existence of heaven and hell or denies biblical morality, you're not going to have a healthy, godly partnership with that mm-hmm. person or with that church. I mean, we could say it's not even really a church, right? I mean, that's Very true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That organization. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where we have to start. And again, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, that's kind of almost it should be the givens, right? Like this is mm-hmm. that should be a baseline. Uh, and we know that people end up in different scenarios for different reasons. But that's as we're approaching it from the from the beginning and approaching, okay, how do we walk through this? That that should be our baseline starting place. Yeah. And you can see the chart behind me, the colors that we use. It's like stop a stoplight, red, yellow, green. Uh, when you're going into some sort of a partnership with uh, somebody who's not a Christian, who's violating in his or her beliefs, primary doctrine, stop. It's red, right? Stop. Mm. You can't go forward. So if you're a single person and you can't find a spouse that agrees on primary doctrine, stay single. The answer isn't, well, just compromise on primary doctrine so you can get married. That is not the answer. If you can't find a church that agrees on what is primary in scripture, well, get, you have to get wise counsel for your particular situation, but maybe move, maybe plant a church. I mean, depending on your situation, it, you just can't compromise and say, well, I'm just going to go to church there because there's nowhere else to go. No, no, don't do it. And there, there's even application there uh, for things like starting business ventures with unbelievers that, that you you know, that these things, you have a completely different value set when it comes to how you engage the just business. You might think of, well, that's, that's the secular world that has nothing to do with theology and stuff. Well, it's going to come into play. It's Mm -hmm. going to have an impact. So you need to be very careful with how you approach joining business ventures with individuals that have a completely different value set than you do. Yes. Now moving out of that primary doctrine. So let's just say, okay, check, check, check. That, that box is checked. Now, when it comes to finding a spouse or finding a church, how far down the line into secondary doctrine and even those matters of opinion, how, how far does that agreement need to extend? That's where it gets more difficult, right? And uh, the first area that I think would be good for us to discuss is the realm of preferences. And this mostly comes into play when you have lots of options. So if there are lots of churches that agree on primary doctrine in your area. Well, now you kind of move into what would, what do I prefer in a church, right? Mm-hmm. What are you most fired up about and what should you be most fired up about? And, and the chart will help you, you know, think through some of that stuff. But, you know, you think about if you're all millennial, could you attend a church that was militantly post-millennial? 
or softer post millennial. Are there are there soft post millennials? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're a millennial, could you marry somebody who's post millennial? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Right. That it's difficult. Uh, if you're a cessationist, if you believe the sign gifts have ceased, could you marry someone who thinks God speaks to him or her? Um, or go to a church where up front the pastor says, God told me this week, yada, yada, yada. If you're a five-point Calvinist, could you handle anything other than five-point Calvinism in those relationships? If you're anti-Christmas, could you handle someone who's really pro-Christmas or a church that puts a Christmas tree in the auditorium? <laughs> um, Pro-Trump, someone who's not necessarily pro-Trump. The Nephilim. Do you consider someone's opinion on the Nephilim in these relationships? Um, it, it all kind of is just a matter of preference, isn't it? Well, yeah, preference and, and conviction um, are, are where, where, how deep are those convictions and which convictions are worth? Again, where, where, where is that dividing line? It, it really comes down to identifying uh, how closely we need alignment on our convictions in those areas. And it's not just convictions about where you are. Like take, take the Christmas thing, for example, at a church. You know, there, there are several people who have a conviction like, uh, I, I can't celebrate Christmas. But they don't have a conviction about attending a church that decorates for Christmas. Right. But, but then there's some people who do. Like, I can't even, I can't go there if their Christmas decorations up. And mm -hmm. their conviction goes that far. So it, there's even like a, a difference of conviction within, under the umbrella of the same conviction essentially right so, um and, and this might be a good place to say we're not here to settle all that for you uh, <laughs> this this is a very difficult conversation always to have because your situation is going to be so different than the next guys and so we're just hoping to throw out some nuggets of wisdom that can help you maybe get the conversation going in the right direction but but it is complicated it's always complicated and it would be impossible to cover every possible scenario because there's yes. just there as many people as there are there are twice as or three times as many possible scenarios and there's no way to cover it so if if we get through this and you're like man i feel like they just asked and raised more questions <laughs> than they answered well yeah that may be true uh but hopefully it's the right kinds of questions that, that gets the gears turning to help yeah. you guide you through how you will answer those questions within your specific context. And we do believe that the chart helps you determine what you should take more yeah. seriously. Absolutely. So, um, primary is going to be primary doctrine is just different than opinions. Primary doctrine is more important than opinions, objectively speaking in the grand scheme of things. Um, that that is something that God's given to all given to all of us in His Word that that is so clear and you just cannot budge at all ever on those issues. Whereas in the realm of opinions, you're still developing and and you're figuring and out figuring out where you can budge and where you can't budge depending on your your convictions. And we also recognize, you know, marriage is a very heavy consideration, even though mm -hmm. we're talking about these at the same time. Entering a marriage is different than entering into membership at a church, right? One is uh, you're making vows for your lifetime. And it's it's very very heavy. And perhaps in a in a church situation, you can give more grace or more room because you've got a bunch of people together with all kinds of different opinions. Whereas marriage, it's one on one, and you're one flesh. And so th those two relationships are different, but in a lot of ways, there's there are similarities here too. For sure. So as we start thinking about all that. Part of what we need to keep in mind as we discuss these different issues is that the context in which we find ourselves is going to go, it plays a, such a massive role in how we work through and how we think through these issues. Yeah, the first realm is what are your preferences when you have options? And the second is just how big is the pool? How many options do you actually even have, right? So um, I wrote down in our show notes a couple of scenarios when it comes to finding a spouse. J just think about how different these two scenarios are as far as context goes. In one scenario, you're a single person who's college age. You're attending a Bible college where everyone there is agreeing to the same doctrinal statement. Everyone there um, who is single is is basically willing to get married and and interested and this might be a good time to find a spouse. I shouldn't say everyone, but the majority, vast majority. And so you're all kind of mingling there under the umbrella of the same doctrine and you're all kind of like figuring out who's going to marry who, right? That's one scenario. 
It's the original, the, other... the original dating service. Swipe right, swipe right. Oh no, yeah, oh, that's a bad joke. <laughs> Bible college is bridal college. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's one scenario. The other scenario: envision a guy who's like in his mid forties, whose wife passed away, and after she passed away, he became a Christian, and he's living in secular progressive Switzerland. And he's also trying to find a spouse. They have two very different pools that they're fishing from when it comes to finding a spouse. They just do. Um, now, in both of those scenarios, primary doctrine is static. Neither one of them gets the yes. opportunity to compromise on what's primary. However, secondary issues and opinions, doubtful things, those uh, offer some flexibility. And, you know... 99, maybe 999 times out of a thousand, the guy in Switzerland who became a Christian later in life, he's just going to offer a lot more flexibility in uh, the, the secondary issues than someone at Bible college who's, you know, in, in that scenario. They're just two very, very different scenes. And, and that's okay. We, we yeah. can say, you know what? That's okay. They're just different. Right. There's nothing, there's not a, you know, Sometimes we might think of this as a having a different standard for what you're willing to uh, willing to embrace and what you're willing to mm -hmm. have your spouse embrace. Yep. And we're, uh, Jeremy mentioned that okay, the primary things they don't they don't change, right? Though those right. are the things we do not have that flexibility with. We and that includes issues of morality. So, like when it comes to, you know, whether or not your standards are higher or lower, we're not talking about morality issues, character issues, Good. no, those things need to be firm and fixed. Like, no, I'm not going to bend on these. We're talking about the different kinds of, uh, of doctrinal convictions that are secondary and tertiary in nature. Mm -hmm. And again, we see the similarity with finding a church too, because some people live in a Bible belt type scenario and they have lots of church options, church on every corner type thing. Yet the, we also recognize in other parts of the world, there are people who are fellowshipping with other Christians underground under threat of persecution, and they're probably not arguing over Christmas decorations <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or what instrumentation to use in music. Uh, and, and they're not selecting fellowships based on that kind of criteria. Yeah. It's just different. It's just different. When churches go to ordain elders, I think they really run into this. I know I did uh, at our church when we established a plurality of elders for the first time. Um, it, it's, okay, wh how, how, how high do you set the standards? You can think of like Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's church out in California that has dozens, literally dozens of elders. I don't know what kind of requirements they have beyond scripture. I mean, it may be that the pool is so big there for them to choose from that they have a standard that you have to have a master's of divinity degree to be an elder there. I don't know. It could be, I mean, I could envision, I could, I could envision a scenario where a church does that because the pool is so big. Mm -hmm. um, and some denominations have done that United Methodist church. You have to have an MDiv to be a pastor or an elder in the United Methodist church or pastor. I don't know how they do their terms, but compare that with you're a church planter in Nigeria and you are just grassroots movement type thing. You're reaching out to people, you're seeing them come to know the Lord and you want to ordain indigenous peoples to be the elders there. Are you going to require them to go online and get a master's of divinity degree before they can be right. elders? No way. Right. Yeah. That, so I, I think that's a pretty comparable scenario where it's just like your, your context kind of determines how much agreement you're going to require in doctrine. And all of that doesn't change the fact that, you know, when it comes to who are elder qualified men, according to the, the character that is listed out in first Timothy one or three, rather in Titus one, yes, uh, that doesn't change, mm -hmm. but there are two qualifications in first Timothy three that are skill-based qualifications. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, well, how, where is the bar set for what makes someone apt to teach mm -hmm. what does it mean that someone manages his household well like when we're talking about the skill-based qualifications that bar can be set at different places depending on context and that's perfectly legitimate and yeah fine okay to do so yep yep the uh the young man in bible college looking for a wife he's really gonna want a young woman to agree with him on basically everything uh because he has that he has that privilege or whatever uh, advantage 
to ha- hold such a prerogative. Whereas someone else in a different scenario who's entering into a second marriage later in life and is living in a difficult place with not a lot of Christians, his standards are just going to be different. Yeah. Right. But primary doctrine, character issues, morality issues, you never get to compromise on no matter where you are. Uh, You never get to capitulate on those things. They remain as everything else is flexible. And so that's, that's kind of the general idea when it comes to starting said relationships, when it goes into the entering into, uh, and we didn't even talk about like friendships, Mm -hmm. generally speaking, but I, I I hope people can take those principles and apply. I think they can, but then there's another situation where you're in a relationship with a spouse, a church, a sibling, a friend, whoever it may be. And you or that other person evolves in doctrine where, you know, take the Bible college couple that gets married because they agreed on everything. That was their standard. And they got married 10 years later, one of them changes his or her hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, well now what do you do? How do you handle relationships when one person evolves in the realm of doctrine? And we're going to talk through this uh, on a couple of different levels. And again, we're going to talk through it kind of more in the in the family relationship level, uh, or you know, it could be you know, again, the extended relationships can can kind of similar principles can apply in some ways. We're going to talk about it in the church context, and we're going to talk about it through ways of what if the other person evolves and changes, then what if you evolve and change, and and how you uh, interact with one another that way. So let, let's start first though with uh, with someone that you're close with, they mm-hmm. begin by rejecting a doctrine that they used to hold to, used to have, used to have this uh, similarity, this commonality in this area. Well, now they have rejected that and they've embraced a different thing that in your eyes is maybe it's less respectable or it's a, it's a, it's a position that you have issues with. How yeah. does that affect that relationship? Well, I think it depends on two things. It, number one is the type of doctrine that's changing. So, and this is so sad when it happens. I mean, say two people get married who are professing believers and one person changes on a primary issue, become, becomes an atheist, maybe, just r- throws out the whole thing. That is much more different than that person changes in the, the realm of what what kind of movies uh, he's watching, you know, I, I mean, the, the two could be related perhaps, but, um, or, or the person, you know, my spouse has started drinking alcohol. Is he getting drunk? No, but he's drinking alcohol and we never used to do that. Okay. Well, that's different than my spouse just said he doesn't believe in God anymore. Okay. Yeah. Those are just two very different conversations. And then the other thing it depends on besides the type of doctrine is the closeness of the relationship. Is it a close, uh, friend or a spouse or a church? Or is it someone that you've known for a while, but you're just like Facebook friends and you're watching it all from afar? So um, I, I think the, the most difficult combination is when it's someone you're close to and it's a secondary issue. <laughs> That's where it gets difficult. Um, because if it, I mean, obviously the most difficult to live through is when it's someone's close to you and it's a primary issue. But when it's like, okay, we got to figure out... Um, you know, some things here when it's like, okay, we're married and you just became a dispensationalist and you didn't used to be. <laughs> How many stories do you hear like that? <laughs> or you just, uh, you just became a, a charismatic, you know, and you didn't used to be, how is that going to, how's that going to work? You know, um, those can be really, really tricky. Uh, now I, I don't want to disparage anybody who's going through like, you know, my, my husband just became an atheist type scenarios. Those are really difficult, but the lines are clearer. I think the lines are fuzzier in that secondary realm. Right. When there are those primary things, the, obviously your conviction cannot change. You have to hold true to what yep. God's word says. You have to stand firm. Um, you know, it's who are you going to, it's, it's the whole, are you going to obey God rather than men type of thing? Um, it's challenging, but clear, right. Mm-hmm, as, as mm-hmm. far as the approach, whereas, the secondary realm can be both challenging and unclear. Yeah. <laughs> We're dealing with with both of those elements. Um, yeah, or your your church. I mean, I'm just going to speak from all sides on all this stuff. Like, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, say say your church comes out. They didn't used to be Calvinistic, and now they're saying we're five point Calvinists. 
if you're not a five point Calvinist, if you're not Calvinistic at all, well, how does that change your relationship with that church? Right? Yeah. Well, again, it, it depends on a lot of factors, uh, going back to your preferences and your context, it, it, it will depend on that, but how you respond is really important and you have to be able to think through these things biblically. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start trying to talk through some of these things. Uh, let's say your spouse, they have either embraced or maybe they're considering embracing a, a doctrine that you reject. Maybe it's, maybe they're uh, embracing a non-cessationist approach, or maybe it's, oh, you know, your, your, your Baptist wife is becoming Presbyterian. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe uh, one of you is becoming more or less Calvinistic than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And you have concerns with that. You're not there. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Step mm -hmm. one, where, where do you begin? I think it makes the most sense to request to walk through this with him or her um, saying, I, I understand that, you know, your mind's starting to go there that way. And just being honest saying, I'm not there, but I want to go through this with you. I want to do the study with you. Uh, whatever you're reading, I want to read. Whatever you're listening to, I want to listen to. Um, but this is a, a part of being one flesh, right? Mm -hmm. And because we're in the realm of secondary doctrine or opinions, your mind might be persuaded too through that study. And that might be a very good thing. You have to be open to that. Um, if you start with, oh, this is the way I've always been. I'm never going to change. You kind of have the wrong attitude going into it. Yes. Now, as you go through that process, you know, you may have red flags along the way and you may have concerns. You may have fears about maybe, you know, you're, you're, you're doing this and I see it leading to these other things that are more, much more clearly contrary to God's word, or, or I, I'm fearful that this might lead in this other direction that I don't believe is healthy. Uh, communicate those things and, mm -hmm. and, and seek to reason through, okay, this, these are the concerns that I'm having with this. This is what I'm seeing. This is where I have seen this lead other people. Are we sure that this is really the biblical position here? Are you sure you really want to take that stance and reason through those things together? Now, as you communicate your concerns and fears and you go through this with your spouse, who's, who's changing, your spouse is evolving. <clears throat> we'll say for the scenario, what happens when you perhaps end up in different places? Like you just arrive one day where we'll use the Baptist or Presbyterian scenario. Your spouse says, well, I'm convinced that we should sprinkle babies. <laughs> and you say, no, I'm not there. I still don't see it. You're going to have to talk about how this impacts your church fellowship, where you attend church, um, and what you do with your children. I mean, hopefully, you know, if a, a wife who seeks to be godly, who seeks to obey God, even when she's right and the husband's wrong, say from our perspective as we analyze it, hopefully she still has a heart of submission in mm -hmm. that and, and submits to her husband because that's what she's called to do. I mean, that's germane to, you know, who God made her to be. Um, but you'll have to have some difficult conversations about family life and church life. And you don't want to end up going to two different churches. Uh, that is bad. It, it gets very difficult. It does. And, and hopefully in the process, okay, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the wife's role in the midst of that hopefully the husband if he's being a, a good and godly man that he is seeking to live with his wife in an understanding way and is seeking to love her sacrificially and is trying to go through this process while also being a godly man who's seeking to lead his family in the direction that he believes is good and right and biblical we can hold those tensions together it's it, it's challenging at times and it, it is um weighty especially mm -hmm. when there is these different uh, differences of opinion on things of this nature and, and no clear path forward either. yeah right where, where you kind of feel like darned if you do darned if you don't you know it's just yeah. like i don't know i don't know what to do and yeah. your local church elders will play a huge role in helping you through that and this is where you know when we mentioned earlier about how firm are your convictions on something and how far are you willing to extend leeway with those convictions is going to play a role in in what what uh, what the end result ends up being in your context. Now, what if you are the disruptor? Okay, the in the previous scenario, we we're kind of talking about your spouse changing, but what if you are the one who's leading change? Essentially, you're saying I'm being convinced by something else, and my wife and my church hasn't changed. I'm I'm changing. Uh, 
how do you walk through that as we'll, we'll just use the role of husband and father as you are how do you walk through that in your own mind ken well, I would hope that as you are studying the scripture and perhaps as you can even sense that, you know, maybe I'm, I, I haven't quite changed my position on this just yet, but you can kind of mm-hmm. see that that's the, the direction you're going. I hope that you're not keeping that to yourself mm-hmm. and then springing it upon your spouse at some point down the road. Like, oh, hey, guess what, honey? I'm now a, I'm now Presbyterian and want to baptize these babies. Let's go. We got to get on with this. I've been watching for the last year. I've been watching a ton of YouTube videos and reading a ton of books and never said a word to you about it. And now I'm here. <laughs> right. Like that is, that, that's, that's bad leadership, right? That, yep. that shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. So hopefully if you do have this, this involvement going on, you're, you're discussing these things with your spouse, like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm being challenged with my understanding in scripture in these areas. And I'm trying to wrestle through things. And perhaps even as you discuss those things together, you can either sharpen the iron together. You can uh, find out areas like, Oh, well, you know, maybe I'm being challenged in these ways. Well, maybe your spouse actually has a very helpful rebuttal to what you're being challenged by. And you could even be pulled back and say, Oh, you know what? I was being persuaded this other way, Mm -hmm. but through this conversation, actually, you know what? I think you're right. I think where we have been is where we need to stay. Or perhaps through that process, it could go down the line and say, you know what? You may both come to the conviction together and move in the same direction together, but it shouldn't ever be a situation where you just spring it upon your spouse someday and say, well, guess what? I am... I am now a continuationist. And in fact, I'm a prophet. Yeah. Yikes. Like, (laughs) don't don't, don't do that. Men, especially married men, the best counselor God has placed in your life is your wife. In so many scenarios, she is right there with you. She knows you so much better than anybody else on earth. Um, Be open about that. I mean, and this can be really tough too. If you're on staff at a church and you've been changing and your livelihood is at stake as far as salary is concerned to be hiding this kind of doctrinal evolution and then springing it on them one day, Hey, I'm leaving and going to a Baptist church or whatever, instead of this Presbyterian church, whatever the case may be. If you've been doing that to these people who you owe it to, to be open, you need to repent and ask for their forgiveness now yeah, and, and humbly submit to their input right now because um, you need it. And God has put them in your life for a reason. He didn't put Vody Bakum on YouTube in your life like he put your wife in your life. He didn't put, you know, whoever you've been listening to online or whoever you've been reading, like he's put your local church elders in your life. So you need to submit and listen for sure. Absolutely. And even as, just as you're going through that process, you know, we are called to live at peace with one another. And so it it should be a it should be a process that is bathed in prayer. It should be a process that is seeking to understand the, the, you know, we mentioned earlier, okay, if you have fears and concerns, you can express that to your spouse. Well, what if your spouse is bringing fears and concerns to you as you're seeking to lead through a potential change? Mm-hmm. You need to be open to hearing those things and receiving those things and be patient. If you have gone through this evolution and this, this change, it may take your spouse longer to arrive at those same convictions Mm -hmm. and you need to be willing to extend grace and be patient through that process. Yeah. Um, the end of the day that we have these general commands as Christians that apply everywhere, live at peace with one another, as far as it depends on you, right? Love one another. So as Christ has loved us, we are also to love one another. And it can be really challenging when it touches the most intimate relationships in our lives, but that's the commission. So um, <clears throat> just to kind of round out this conversation there, we're going to get into the realm of overlap here where we're going to say some of the same things over and over again, but maybe speaking at it from a couple different more angles would be helpful. If you're going to a church and the church changes its doctrine and secondary matters or whatever, well, it's kind of the same as with your spouse. I Request of the elders of your local church to walk through that with you to explain um, their thought process to communicate mm-hmm. uh, their opinion on this and, and then communicate with them, your concerns and your understanding of, of doctrine. And once again, you might be persuaded if you're open to, to this, when your spouse is going through it, be open when your church is going through it and you might be persuaded and that could be a good thing, but you also have to think through what are your commitments to that church? What do you owe to that local fellowship? 
Uh, do you view your membership there like a marriage? They are different. So you might want to be very careful about how closely <laughs> you align those two. Um, but but what have you given your word to do or to be in that church? And and maybe it's not so much an ongoing indefinite thing, but maybe you said, you know, I, I'm going to do this for X amount of time. And, and, you know, by scripture, you can still be there and do that leading a class or, or coaching a team or whatever it may be for that, that fellowship. Um, but then maybe later on down the road, it comes a time where you say, we're just not on the same page and I need to look somewhere else. So, yeah. it, and if you're free to leave, you also have to consider what are your other options? Because even if it is something that makes you want to leave, maybe there's no better option outside of that. And, and God has called you to still remain there. And that's going to be, again, this goes back to the context conversation we were having at the start of the episode where, you know, a place in, you know, the Bible belt is going to look very differently in what your options are versus yes. a place that is, you know, post-Christian or it doesn't have any, it is a unreached people group, you know, yeah. or something of that but nature. You're underground in North Korea. Right. Shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one thing that we could note, even as we're discussing churches evolving you know, we, we're using the term doctrine perhaps a little bit more loosely in terms of it, it, maybe it's not like a uh, we are changing our position on uh, the nature of Jesus Christ or we're changing our position on, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism. Maybe it's just a philosophical change yeah. about, you know, we used to do only approach. Yeah, we used to do Sorry. only hymns and now we're doing you know, more contemporary stuff. Uh, you know, we used to we used to do this and now we're doing that. And it's just mm -hmm. a philosophical difference. Mm -hmm that you need to think through and be able to, you have a difference of opinion on those areas. Well, have those conversations, have them in grace and all the other things that we just mentioned apply. We used to sing Hillsong and Elevation Worship, but now we're only going to sing good music. And if you have a problem with that, you need to repent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there are all kinds of scenarios, right? I mean, uh, sorry, I was, I was thinking of things and saying them while you were you were talking no, okay. like, like evangelistic method. I mean, some churches may get more militant, combative in their evangelistic approach in a way that makes someone uncomfortable. I mean, mm. yeah, so totally philosophical approach could be could be a big factor there. And if and if you're the one who has changed, maybe your church hasn't changed, but you're the one who has changed. Again, like in a marriage, communicate with the elders of that church all the way through and seek their wisdom, seek their counsel, seek their instruction, be open to be corrected by them because you're being persuaded by scripture or another teacher somewhere. Well, also open yourself up to be persuaded by the instruction of your local church elders based on the word of God. Yes. And think through what, again, what are your commitments to that church? And if you decide to stay, think through how you're going to behave. How will you behave in that fellowship? And and think about if you go, where will you go? You know, you got to consider all of that stuff and um, do what's right by God in that. And again, living at peace and loving one another. Yeah, this could get into uh, kind of a conversation that we could almost spend a more, you know, do a, do a whole episode on just this point about how, how, what is a ethical way to change, you know, your doctrinal position on something and, and, and what that should, that process should be like, obviously we would hope you'd be convinced by scripture, but so often I think sometimes we can go through doctrinal evolutions, perhaps because we're sticking our head and it's only in one side of the argument. And so we're mm -hmm. persuaded, but we're not even actually hearing the other side of the argument. And perhaps we just want to change. And so we're only listening to these arguments. We're not considering both sides. Yes. So that's where the council of the elders can really become such a huge benefit and and hopefully even even corrective of that. It's like, okay, you've been listening to only these resources. Well, maybe consider some of these others as well and, and kind of hear both sides of that to be able to answer potential objections, but arrive at a conclusion that hopefully is because you're convinced by scripture. That's mm -hmm. that's what should be convincing us. But there should be a balance in how we're we go through those kinds of evolutions. And the, so we've talked about starting relationships and in the middle of relationships, what to do. One that something that doesn't really fit into either one of those categories is raising children. And we'll finish mm -hmm. with this. How do you use the chart as a paradigm in raising children? How far do you extend your doctrinal convictions <laughs> in the raising of your children? Well, let's start with a couple of uh, basic responsibilities as parents. 
as Christian parents. Number one, you are responsible to teach your children the truth. Okay. Yes. That just flat out, you have to own that. That's your responsibility and embrace it with joy. Mm-hmm. Secondly, you are responsible to give your children appropriate freedoms at appropriate ages. And that's where it gets hairy, right? Yeah. Like uh, letting your kids pick out their own clothes. That's a pretty low level freedom that you can, you know, start at, a, at an earlier age, depending, right? Like, oh, yeah, they, they can figure that out. Um, fixing their own lunch. You know, when does the child get to choose what he or she wants for lunch and to do all of it himself or herself? Then as they get older, picking a college, I mean, I mean you're, you're guiding them through this, through all these things. You're, you're there as a parent, as a guide, but are you going to say, no, you're going to this college or are they going to get to have their voices heard? Finding a church once they move out and go somewhere, uh, finding a spouse, Okay, how much freedom do the children get in those areas? Well, they need to get the appropriate amount of freedom at the appropriate time. And it's so tough. Like this is this is really you know there's there's not like a perfect way you can just there's there's no chart for this, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, like yeah. That, that just doesn't exist and it can't because of right. just the impossible nature of that. It, it, you're trying not to fall into two sides of of the ditch there where you've got the over dictating everything to where your children have never mm-hmm. experienced what it, you know, there's, it's just so rigid and so yeah. lined out that when the child finally is out of the home, they're like a rudderless ship because you've been steering it the whole time that you've not yes. been given them the tools necessary to make decisions as they get older. Correct. But then on the other side, you don't want to give them so much leeway and freedom that they are just out They're making such foolish decisions very early on because they're everything has been left so wide open for them that there's no guidance. You're harming your child in both cases, Mm -hmm. right? If there's no direction and you're not teaching them truth, you're not teaching them what God's word says or giving them principles and, and seeking to instruct them from God's word. It's, it's going to be harmful on either side of that ditch. So we can say, let's raise them with Christian presuppositions, that's truth, right? We need to raise them in the truth, give them Christian presuppositions and all that you do that, that God is, um, that the gospel is true, uh, that God has spoken. He's given us a book. You raise, you raise them with those presuppositions and you want to give them too. I think all the reasons why you believe and do all that you believe and do, um, help them to understand the why behind it. Why are we Baptists? Why are we cessationists? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why don't we celebrate Christmas? Why don't we celebrate Halloween? Why do we celebrate Halloween? You know, you go through the whole list. Why, why don't we, why, why don't we play sports uh, on Sundays? Why don't we play sports on Wednesday night during Bible study? Uh, you know, why, why do we make the choices we make? Equipping them with all the reasons behind that. Cause you're the parent, you call the shots. You're the authority. You set, you set the tone, you make the rules. But also not just giving it to them like this is what it is, but this is why it is what it is, mm-hmm. right? And so we want to do that, I think, as much as possible, especially as they get older and they can understand more. Um, but also as they get older, the chart becomes more and more relevant for what they're free to do, either in agreement with you or if they're making different choices than what you would prefer them to make. <laughs> so say your your son grows up, he goes off to college, he's out of the house and He's 21 years old, and for his 21st birthday, he doesn't go get hammered somewhere, but say he goes and gets a tattoo, which is not something you would want for your son, not something you would do yourself. You, you've never gotten a tattoo, but he's a Bible-believing fundamentalist, not the bad fundamentalist term, but like he believes in the fundamentals of Scripture and the fundamentals of the Christian faith, but he, he got a tattoo. So do you care, really? Um, are you going to make a deal out of that? Now, I'm not the, saying the tattoo should better be the chart, though. <laughs> the chart, yeah, or or Jesus fish. Uh, <laughs> those are the two two options. Um, I, I'm not saying don't talk to your child about these things. You know, I, I would never say that. But how much importance are you going to put on that? Knowing he loves the Lord and he's living for the Lord, he just made a different decision than you would have made in this realm of opinions, right? Yeah, the chart helps us kind of balance that out and not get so weird about stuff when the most important things are taken care of. Yeah. Things can get more difficult though, as you consider different kinds of scenarios, Uh, consider uh, maybe you have a adult daughter, she, her and her husband, they've got kids and they've chosen to 
uh, celebrate Halloween in ways that maybe you're not comfortable with, but also they don't go to church. Uh, they, they, even though your daughter may have made a profession of faith, uh, she's not in a local church. She's not uh, part of a church. What are going to be your priorities as you seek to uh, talk to her and, and reason with her? Are you going to spend the time focused on the issue of, of Halloween? Or are you going to spend the time focused on the issue of, is she going to embrace the, that which she previously professed to believe in? Is she going to hold, hold to her profession of faith or confession, the things that, that uh, she once said that were true of her in her life as far as her belief in Christ? Or is she going to be in rejection of that? Where are your priorities going to fall? Well, understanding the chart can help us know where we ought to be placing the emphasis in those conversations. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It's, it is largely about emphasis, isn't it? And how we uh, go about interacting with our children. Um, you know, obviously the goal here is we want to raise Christians. We are Christians. We want to raise Christians. We want to see a Christian legacy go from generation to generation. I mean, I know early on, I communicated to Melissa that I want to be a grandpa. You know, my, my first exposure to her family, uh, really was at her extended family was at a Thanksgiving dinner and it was 2009, I guess it was. And we went there and it was the first time I'd ever seen the family kind of stand up, gather around, say what they're thankful for, hold hands and pray with a, the grandpa giving a devotional. Um, I was still a relatively new Christian and it was like, this is amazing. I didn't know families did this, you know, <laughs> and, and that's the goal. I told her, I want to be you're like your grandpa. I can't wait. You know, that's the goal. But through that, you, you don't get there by dictating every little thing to your kids based on your own convictions, but you also don't get there by saying, well, I'm going to go hands off. And if the Lord's going to save him, he's going to save him and yada, yada, yada. There is right. somewhere in between here that you got to figure out. And, and we believe the chart is helpful for those types of scenarios. Yes, we do. Well, as we said at the beginning, you know, the, the reality may be that this raised more questions than it answered for you. Hopefully, though, our, our hope and our, our prayer, um, I don't, you guys may not, you know, guys don't know this because we never told you. We actually pray before we do these episodes uh, because we want these things to be a benefit for God's church. We want them to be a benefit for you, the listener. And our hope and our prayer is that this has been a beneficial at least conversation starter as you begin to right. wrestle with some some challenging, some sometimes even the most challenging yeah. discussions that we can have as believers wrestling through relational issues. We hope this is is provided a good starting place for that conversation. Yep. Talk to your spouse, talk to your local church leaders, talk to that friend that you've been thinking about, whatever the case may be, have those conversations. And again, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. And, and let's wash one another's feet too while we're at it. Okay. Amen. And hey, uh, go ahead and head on over to store.dotheology.com and enter code DT hood for 10% off a hoodie. You should do that. Yeah. I want to mention too, uh, another way oh, that, yeah. that you can, uh, support the show is actually through this buy me a coffee platform. We were, we were supposed to remind each other about that. And uh, yeah, we both forgot until here at the very end, but, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's almost like a, um, it's like a giftless Patreon <laughs> where you can either give like donate like a one-time donation or you could subscribe for like a monthly thing, but there's no rewards for it. Like there's no like tears or anything. You just, if this is something that you'd like to do and we had somebody buy us a coffee, we do have one uh, monthly supporter and we're grateful for that. But this, this a uh, couple of weeks ago, Gregory bought us a coffee and he gave us this comment. You men have been a joy to listen to for myself and, and my group of young men seeking Christ. Thank you for providing a biblically solid yet challenging source for learning theology in a practical way. So we thank you, Gregory, for your support. It's, it's very meaningful to us. We're, we're very grateful for that. And hey, if anybody else is, uh, Lord puts it on your heart for that as well, you want to co-labor with the, us in this to where we can continue to get these resources out to more individuals. Uh, that's an option. There's a link within the show notes to buy me a coffee and you can support us through that means. So we thank you for that. 
Thank you very much. So glad you joined us today. Hope this is helpful. Send us a message. And uh, if you have any further questions, we'd love to entertain that. We actually have a mailbag episode coming up. I yeah. think it's going to be a month from now, our mailbag episode where we're answering your questions. So send them in. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, do theology.